let's talk about the different components of design and the ways that the methods that you can use in that design. <clears throat> These are unusually complex structures compared to some of what you may be designing. They have four, at least four different relevant standards that you may be referencing as part of the design. And we'll go through them in order here in the, next, the upcoming slides. We'll talk about, you first use AS4678 to assess the properties of the soil and to calculate the loading of the soil on the retaining wall itself. Then you'll look at the geotechnical capacity of the retaining wall. That means a laterally loaded pile and what the force couple is below that soil. That's AS2159. Then you'll look at the post and the pile if present below it as well. You'll look at the structural strength of that. That you just go to the structural standard and we're gonna focus exclusively on steel posts here. So that means AS4100. Finally, you'll design your sleeper. Sleepers can be made, be made of any of several different materials. Most common are timber or concrete. You have some increasingly common composites or plastics that are coming in as well. But really, you can use just about any material that's going to survive in an open environment um, for your sleeper. So for timber or concrete, that would mean AS1720.1 or AS3600 for designing those. So first, one of the most useful things AS4678 provides. Now, it's a relatively vague standard. Um, as is common for a lot of geotechnical standards in Australia, it doesn't tell you equation by equation what to do for your calculations. But one of the most useful things it does provide is it outlines exactly what limit states you need to be checking. Now, it outlines more than we're going to talk about in this webinar. Some of those uh, limit states are irrelevant for a sleeper retaining wall. Bearing just kind of isn't relevant. Um, it's never going to be a failure mode for a sleeper retaining wall. Just there's so much pile going down there and there's not a lot of vertical load on the retaining wall structure itself. And anchor rod failure, well, there are no anchor rods that we're gonna be considering for the sleeper retaining wall, so they can't fail. The relevant limit states here are, you have your first, your geotechnical uh, limit states of translation, the whole retaining wall moving to the side. Rotation, we already saw one failure mode of that with the retaining wall tilting forward. You'd have structural failure um, in either the sleeper or the post. And you have one service limit state that can be important to look at, and that's deflection. So we'll talk about all of these. But really the most vital thing for you to first assess in a sleeper retaining wall is the soil properties. Now I'm sure uh, we have people from multiple different backgrounds on here who are used to different types of geotechnical reports. Uh, for a small residential property, you may be getting a pretty basic report that will that may not tell you much more than whether you have clay or sand and um, whether it's in situ or whatever, or some very, very basic information about it that you'll have to make a lot of inferences from. If you're used to a commercial or industrial design, you may be getting extremely detailed uh, reports that may tell you exactly what the internal angle of friction fee is, exactly what that shear coefficient is. That's great if you do, that's the best case. You do wanna be as accurate as possible, um, but yeah, well, you do the best you can with whatever information you have. The most important information you'll need to know is the soil type whether you have cohesive or cohesionless soil, cohesive meaning clay, cohesionless meaning sand or gravel for the most part. Clear calc supports any type of material for a backfill, but we only support cohesive foundation soils right now. Um, we do have plans for extending this to cohesionless, although those are a different set of analysis equations. Uh, so that has not been implemented yet. <clears throat> You'll often be estimating uh, the internal angle of friction, the shear coefficient, all these various uh, factors listed in my next bullet point here from other information. That'll usually be provided to you on your geotechnical report. Sometimes you may need to do some follow-up to estimate these. 
quite often those parameters are estimated from a penetration test of some form, SPT or CPT. Um, one particular caution I would give, however, the undrained shear strength, sometimes called the undrained cohesion, is a completely different value from the effective cohesion. So C sub U versus C prime, those are completely different values. They do have, there is a relationship between them, but it's vague. You can't really directly convert between them. Just make sure you're using the right one when you are entering information into um, any calculation for your retaining. Soil condition is usually pretty easy to assess. Quite most frequently, your foundation soil is going to be in C2, and you're going to have some type of either control or uncontrolled for your backfill. Might be different, different than that. That's usually pretty easy to assess, though. Um, the other important piece of information is the height of the groundwater. Sleeper retaining walls are fantastic for retaining groundwater, given that there is space often between those sleepers. But it can be used still, and we do consider that in clear calcs. You can make use of a groundwater height that's within the backfill. Um, most commonly, as I mentioned, backfill soil and foundation soil are different. Um, so we do provide different separate inputs for those. Now, finally, before you leave AS4678, you'll want to look at the loading. Now, um, AS4678, relatively vaguely, only tells you to, quote, use appropriate engineering principles and kind of leaves it up to you to figure out what that means. There is an appendix that's informative, it's not mandatory, that tells you about some of them. Most common methods are Rankine, Rankine Bell, or Coulomb. Uh, that's used to calculate what's called the active pressure coefficient and really comes down to this one equation shown in, on the bottom of the slide. We use the Rankine Bell equation, which is this. The main assumptions in that are that you have the dead load and the groundwater can be represented by a triangular distributed load, and the live load surcharge is represented by a uniform distributed load. That, that is along the height of the retaining. One caution I would also give here, um, Amendment 1 to AS4678, uh, which was issued about 10 years ago, it's actually relatively old now, uh, changed the minimum live load surcharge. In particular, if your retaining wall is higher than 1.5 meters, you have to have a minimum surcharge of at least 5 kPa. We've noted uh, in reviewing some of the manufacturer literature on this that some of the span tables provided by sleeper retaining wall manufacturers still use that old 2.5 kPa even when it's technically not allowed anymore by Amendment 1. So you can see a difference between our calculations and clear calcs, where we are considering that Amendment 1, versus uh, calculations um, or span table values shown by manufacturers. So you can see a difference in that. Just use caution with that. Um, next, we'll go to, once we have that loading information, we'll go to calculating the geotechnical capacity of the retaining wall. So that means the laterally loaded piles standard, AS2159. With this, you're going to basically be assessing all the geotechnical limit states. That means translation and rotation. Again, like 4678, 2159 is relatively vague as to the specific methods used. In rough order from simplest to most complex. Some of the common methods used are Hosking, Zerniak, Brahms, Poulos, PY curves, or any of various FEA methods. All of those are fairly common. At ClearCalc, we use a Brahms method. What you'll notice is sort of in the middle of that list. Um, it's not the simplest. It's also not the most complicated. Why would you do that? Um, there are two reasons. One, I mean, it's a bit easier for us to use a not the most complicated method. Uh, and it's easier for you to follow as a user when the analysis is a little bit simpler. But more importantly, to use some of those more complex methods, those PY curve and FDA methods, you need to have more accurate soil information. So you really need to have a more accurate geotechnical report. You can't really make good assumptions um, on your soil properties safely 
when you're using those more advanced methods. At ClearCalc here, we assess the different methods. We decided that Brahms was a good balance of something that's accessible to our users, where you will usually have all the information you need to complete that method. Um, it's understandable um, and it's still accurate enough um, to provide you good quality results. So what does it mean to have a simpler or more complex method? On the far left here, you can see what the actual soil reaction might look like in a laterally loaded pile. It's going to be some type of curve. It may not be quite as smooth as is shown in this, but it's going to be some type of curve. Dealing with that analytically is almost impossible. Um, so all these different methods have come up with ways to simplify that down to something that can actually be calculated. Brahms method simplifies that down to two rectangles of soil reaction. So those of you familiar with concrete design will recognize this is the same idea as the Whitney stress block in concrete design. It's simplifying a complex curve to a rectangle. Um, some of the more complex methods, so there's PY curves are shown on the far right here, that you need a ton of information to do accurately. It's based upon uh, effective nonlinear springs at different depths within the soil. And it's extremely difficult to actually run through all the calculations for. So Brahms method it is, we'll be using those uh, rectangles of stress to calculate exactly how much soil capacity there is and how much rotation occurs within that soil. So that takes care of our geotechnical limit states. We would then move on to the structural limit states. These, a bit more straightforward. Uh, many of you will be used to going through the structural standards already. Uh, this is just going through AS4100. The only real difference between a post in a sleeper retaining wall and a normal beam column design is that your loads are going to include soil loads. So it's a load common, making use of a load combination that you may not commonly be using in your structural calculations. Um, it is worth noting that the structural load combinations are a bit more prescriptive, uh, defined by uh, AS1170.0. They're a bit more prescriptive than the geotechnical load combinations. Um, which can, may be modified a bit, they may be slightly different. So even though you're using the same loads, the load combinations may be a little bit different between structural and geotechnical. Um, of note, the concrete pile embedments are not actually assumed to add strength. It's essentially unnecessary. Um, the highest uh, stress point in a sleeper retaining wall structurally is at the very base of the retaining wall, which is gonna be above the pile anyway. There's very little benefit in actually considering that pile. Um, so it is a conservative assumption, but we make that assumption, it's a very common assumption, not assuming that, that pile adds any real strength. Once you have that post designed, then you would look at the sleepers. As I mentioned, the sleepers may be any of uh, numerous different materials. Most common is timber or concrete, but all sorts of different materials are possible. In clear calcs, we've made this so that you can link to any beam material we have, and I'll show you when we run through our worked example what that means. Um, but it means that we can use any beam material available in clear calcs. You could theoretically design a cold form steel sleeper, although that would be extremely unusual and difficult to deal with the environmental issues um, to prevent that cold form steel from rusting. Nevertheless, it is possible. You can do it. Most commonly, you're going to end up using one sleeper size for the entire height of the retaining wall. However, technically, you can actually optimize that as much as you would like. Um, you may recall we talked about those triangular distributed loads where the soil actually imparts upon the retaining wall. That triangle is at its largest at the bottom of the retaining wall. So technically, that bottom sleeper needs to be considerably stronger than the top sleeper. You can optimize that if you want. You can have your top sleeper be much weaker. You can have as many different sizes or strengths as you'd like. Up to you to decide what, what is most economically efficient is generally the question on that. 
Uh, but yeah, you can optimize that or not optimize that as much as you would like. Finally, going to that one serviceability limit state on deflection, you can consider deflection based upon the host only. That's a little diagram on the left here where we'll effectively assume a fixed support at the soil. Um, that would be only considering the structural deflection of the post. Or you can include the pile rotation. And that's the diagram on the right here where you assume that the pile might be rotating within the soil. So you're including the geotechnical uh, rotation there as well. In general, um, this is not a hard and fast rule. It's not defined by the standard. In general, um, you would include that pile rotation for particularly tall retaining walls where failure is a bigger deal, or if you are not embedding that retaining wall at an angle. So quite commonly for shorter retaining walls, especially, you might uh, embed your sleeper retaining wall to begin with at a five degree, let's say, angle towards the soil. So you might actually embed that towards the backfill a little bit. That means that that deflection is going to be effectively counteracted um, by the pre-rotation you're putting in. So if you're doing that, you might not bother considering the pile rotation. In clear calcs, we give you the option to consider that or not. If you are comparing us to other software packages or other calculations you're looking at, useful to be aware here that different packages consider different things. Um, some packages might only be considering post deflection. Some might be including pile rotation. You just need to uh, assess that for yourself um, and figure that out when you, if you are comparing us to other platforms.